This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church. I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, give God the praise this morning and thank the Lord for blessing us to be here and to see another day, to see another Sunday. And as uh, the Psalm 150 verse 6 says, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Uh, we can go through our storms, but as long as we are going through those storms, we can still give God the praise and the glory because we know that as children of God, he goes through it with us, but we're not alone. And as always a purpose and a reason. And so I just want to say that again, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And so with that, uh, this is the International Adult Bible Study Ministry. Uh, the mission of this ministry, brothers and sisters, is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus to Christ through the study, the study and the teaching of the Word of God. And with that, I want to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Our study is going to be coming from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So let us take a moment and clear our minds and let's have a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us to see another day. We thank you for the provisions of life. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us that we don't deserve. We ask and pray, Father, now that the Holy Spirit will bless us, Lord, with an understanding of your Holy Word, and that he will take full control of this Bible study ministry. I ask and pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so we are going to get started this week. Our key verse is going to be coming from James chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, listen, dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? And so our title for today is the responsibility of those who are called, the responsibility of those who are called. The next week, our lesson will be, our biblical study will be coming from uh, 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And again, uh, brothers and sisters, you can see the link uh, that if you want to view previous uh, biblical studies on YouTube, uh, there's a link uh, in front of you there. You can go there and you can review those as well. All right, so uh, historical background, a little bit about James. James was the half brother of Jesus. Now he did not believe in Jesus before the resurrection, according to John chapter seven, verse three through five, verses three through five. And he was not among uh, the original 12 disciples of the Lord. We know this. Uh, if he had, he would have been, uh, it would have been an, a natural for him to be called an apostle in his address to the 12 tribes that he is speaking to. And only after the day of Pentecost did James come to believe in the Lord Jesus the Christ, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Now, Paul said that James had been a witness of the risen Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, which may have marked the time of his conversion. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles and in other New Testament epistles, there is a James who stood out prominently, brothers and sisters, as a pillow of the church in Jerusalem, whose position and character exactly suited the author of this letter. And so, unlike Paul and Peter, who introduces themselves as apostles of Christ. James confirms his faith in Christ from the beginning of his epistle, introducing himself as what? As a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus to Christ, you see. And so by the mid forties AD, uh, he had become the leader of the Judaic Christianity, of leader of Judaic Christianity. And he served as the leader of the Jerusalem Council, spoken of in Acts chapter 15, verses 6 through 15. Paul, 
I have a place as James among, among the apostles, listing him alongside of Peter or Cephas and John as pillars of the church. Now we find that in Galatians chapter two, verse nine, and given the details of his life and death, it's reasonable to suppose that James's letter was written around AD, in the AD 50s, if not in the late 40s. And so this would make it one of the earliest writings of the New Testament and likely written from Jerusalem. The epistle of James, its character and contents makes no reference to Gentiles. His position, character and content and the contents of his letter clearly shows that his intended audience is to the Jews. The fact that most of the letter is addressed to Jewish Christians, James may have also been thinking of what took place among unbelieving Jews as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it is clear, it is clear that the recipients of the letter are scattered among the nations. Uh, it's a reference to what is called the diaspora. And we find that in James chapter one, verse one, and John chapter seven, verse 35. And we find it also in first Peter chapter one, verses one and two, which most likely took place after the death of Stephen. In other words, the diaspora, the dispersion, the scattering of the saints most likely took place after the death of Stephen. And so as we continue on, we find that unlike Paul's letters, James lacks the typical thanksgiving and closing. Uh, he proceeds loosely from topic to topic, appealing to the Old Testament quite often. And so when reading this letter, brothers and sisters, you want to keep in mind that the tenor of James's letter is thoroughly Jewish, having been written by a Christian of Jewish background, two Christians of Jewish backgrounds who had been scattered among the nations and suffered persecutions because of their faith in Jesus the Christ. And so James confirms telling them and believers in Christ Jesus today to count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces Patience. And I'll say that again, brothers and sisters. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, he says, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so we find that in James chapter one, verse three and verse 12. And so the key words here are testing and endure, testing and endure. And so the promise of believers, of believers receiving the crown of life is also mentioned in Revelation chapter two, verses eight through 10 when the Lord tells the angel of the church in Smyrna to write these words of assurance, telling the church to do what? To be faithful unto de until death, and I will give you the crown of life. These words of, of exhortation are meant for every believer in Christ Jesus today, from the first century to the 21st century. That's what these words mean, that those who are faithful even unto death, he says, I will give you a crown of life. Now, we're going to talk more about these crowns later on in our study, but this takes us to our study for this morning. And so what we find in James chapter 2, verse 1, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our, do, you know, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus to Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. And so as we move towards our study in chapter two, James reminds us and exhorts his audience that when they are tempted, it does not come from the Lord God. 
It does not come from the Lord God. This is true, friends. While it is true that our God does not tempt us, the belief in Christ can, however, or the believer in Christ can, however, be tested as in the case of Abraham. So there's a big difference between being tempted and being tested. But the scriptures are clear. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. According to James chapter 1, verse 13. Temptations, brothers and sisters, are always among us. It is when we yield to its enticement and allure because of our curiosity or something else that we exhibit a form of weakness to the flesh. And in doing so, it results, the, uh, its results can become harmful both physically, uh, you know, an example of excessive, uh, excessive eating, for example. So it's, it's, you know, when we, when we yield to certain temptations, it can become harmful physically as well as spiritually if yielding to it takes us out of the will of God and causes us to sin against God. So there are temptations. Uh, I like chocolate. Sometimes I'm tempted to eat a little bit more chocolate than I should. And so I, you know, I need to watch that. But James reminds the believing Jews. He says, therefore, to, be do, to do what? He says, to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath or anger. And if, the, and if there are those among the believers who think he is religious, James says, but does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is useless. So James is tied in. I know James is, is he, you know, is, he is loosely worded, but when you read it and study it, it does make sense because as he's talking about being swift to hear, slow to speak and so and slow to anger. And then he follows up with these words of, of saying that, you know, if there are those among the believers, he says, who thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue, you see, that's key, that's critical. He deceives his own heart and his religion is useless. But I want to be clear here, brothers and sisters, Jesus did not come to this earth to start a religion. Just want to make that clear. He came to establish a relationship. He came to establish a relationship. Therefore, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Our proclaiming that we are born again believers in Christ Jesus is not only demonstrated by the way that we live, but also by the things that we say, the tongue, and how well we control the thoughts of our mind. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, and in Luke chapter 6, verse 44, that a tree is known by its fruit, he says. This applies both to the saved and unsaved, that what's in the heart is eventually revealed by the words that come out of the mouth. Think about that for a moment. What's in our heart is revealed by the words that come out of our mouth and our actions. And so the tree is known by its fruit. And just as James spoke of temptations and the bridling of the tongue, he quickly turns now to the discussion of favoritism. Now, verse one is not a question, as some might take it to be, but rather it's a simple statement of faith in our Lord Jesus to Christ, the Lord of glory, that having faith also requires the believer to remain impartial in his or her walk with God as Jesus did with the Father according to Mark chapter 12, verse 14. That is our walk with impartiality. 
In verses 2 and 3, James says this, For if there should come into your assembly a man with, a gold, ring, with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy rags, or filthy clothes rather, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, you see. It's important to know that the epistle of James reproduces more of the words spoken by Jesus to Christ our Lord and Savior than are to be found in all the other letters of the New Testament taken together. That's very interesting. Our Lord gave parables of those who show partiality and its results. Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 is one example how the rich treated the poor and the results of that treatment. So I encourage you to read Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31. One of the moral laws of the Old Testament that was found in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 15 says you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Now, Jesus has taken that right into the New Testament. James has taken it right into the New Testament. In some churches today, sadly speaking, people who come through the door wearing jeans and a shirt are frowned upon by some members of that church, yet the individual following that person is dressed in a suit and tie and gets a, a warm welcome, a greeting with smiles, and he's approached or she's approached by those same members who frowned upon the individual wearing the jeans and shirt. And so verse 4 says it all. Verse 4 says, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? When that is done in the church, this is what's happening. You're showing partiality among yourselves and, have, and become judges with evil thoughts. That's what James is saying, if you think about it. Jesus told a parable. In Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14, after seeing many coming to an invitation, you see, how they, how they chose the best places to sit, he says. Our Lord first warned them that whoever exalts himself, in other words, become proud and prejudiced, he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And said, he says later that to him, who the, the, the individual who had invited him, he says, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, Jesus says, invite the poor, the man, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, he says, because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just, at the resurrection of the just. James asks his audience a rhetorical question based on two accusations taken from this verse. And the answer to both questions is assumed to be yes, brothers and sisters. One is that of showing partiality towards certain groups or people. Today, it would be expressed by the idea of being discriminated against and showing prejudice. The second is that of judging or having evil thoughts which carries with it the idea of being divided in your own mind, friends. Our Lord was clear on this matter. In his Sermon on the Mount, or as some would call it, the Beatitude, 
in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, writes that the words of the Savior saying this, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Again, we look at the words spoken in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15, which says that you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, he says, you shall judge your neighbor. Jesus, however, tells us something else. Jesus tells us in John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says that the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Therefore, you and I are not to judge others, but rather judge the actions and words of our own doing. Of our own doing. And so he says in verse 5, he says, listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who loved him? James now wants the ear of the listener and poses another question concerning the poor of this world, or rather, the poor as to the world. See, that God has chosen them to be rich in faith. Not, there's nothing here that says God has chosen them to be rich materially. God says nothing about being rich materially. He says to be rich in faith, which I think is much more, uh, much more uh, better, if you will, than being uh, rich materially. And he says that uh, he, has, he has made a promise. God has made a promise that they who love him would become heirs of the kingdom. What kingdom? He's talking about. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Jesus confirms the promise of the Father when he gave his Sermon on the Mount, saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom that God is referring to. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning heirs of the kingdom which God promised to those who love him. And as James says in James 1.12, and the crown of life. So there's the promise of being in the kingdom of heaven. And then there's the promise of receiving the crown of life. The promise, brothers and sisters, was made to us. It was made to us. Paul wrote that what, had, what was laid up for him was a crown of righteousness, according to 2 Timothy verses, verse, uh, 4, chapter 4, verse 8. Christ said that when he returns, believers would receive a, a crown of glory that fades not away, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. So brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, it would seem that the believer in Christ will be blessed with a heavenly triple crown. A heavenly triple crown, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of glory. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18 writes the words, <clears throat> of one, excuse me, of, of the one telling him of the vision that he had seen, saying that the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, he says, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. You and I will possess the kingdom of heaven forever and ever. He's talking about us, brothers and sisters. He's talking about the saints, both Old Testament and New Testament. The true believers in Christ Jesus. That's who he's talking about. 
And so listen to the words of Isaiah. As he prophesied the acts of the coming Savior, saying that his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And so Matthew chapter 25 tells us, he says, when Jesus returns to judge the nations, when our Lord returns to judge the nations, he says, all nations will be gathered together before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, inherit the kingdom, there it is again, the kingdom of heaven, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the foundation, from the beginning of the world, beginning of creation, if you want to go back that far. God had already planned that for those who would believe in him. Though the Lord has chosen the poor in spirit, the humble and the righteous of this world to become heirs of the kingdom of heaven. By contrast, brothers and sisters, Christ says to those who rejected him and served themselves in this life, telling them this, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Though the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, the wicked of this world will be gathered together with them. This, brothers and sisters, is called the second death. The second death. Now, in James chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, James says this, But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich possess, or oppress rather, oppress you, and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Among James's readers were some who dishonored the poor. That's why James is making this statement. Some had even done so by open discriminatory treatment. As James mentions in chapter two, verses two and three, James's accusations are aimed at the rich as well, and the unconverted Jews who were most likely dragging the poor believing Jews to the synagogues and to heathen courts. And so brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, favoritism is not, is not only inconsistent with the nature of God, nature of God. It is also illogical given that it is the rich, if you will, who are the source of oppression. And it seems that deference towards the rich is a human tendency. By their behavior, the rich who oppress and pretend that it is godliness. They oppress and pretend that it is godliness. But such pretense amounts to blasphemy or slander against what James calls the noble name of Jesus. That's the name that we are called by, the noble name of Jesus. The Jews would, be, would, uh, would not be likely to associate blasphemy with any other name unless it was a divine name, you see. And so we find in verses, uh, verse 8, we find that it says, Jesus, uh, James says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. You do well, he says. James is meaning or mentioning of the fulfilling of the royal law according to the scriptures. It points to the Old Testament scripture found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance 
nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus' declaration that it was one of the two greatest commandments show the imperative, brothers and sisters, of this commandment. That's also found in Mark chapter 12, verse 31, when our Lord, speaking of the second greatest commandment, said this, and the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater, no other commandment greater than these. And he's talking about those two, loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and spirit, a soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And so loving one's neighbor excludes partiality and prejudice. To love your neighbor, you must exclude partiality and prejudice. And lest we forget, friends, sometimes our neighbor is also our enemy. So if you're wondering, like the young lawyer that was talking to Jesus, who is your neighbor? Our Lord gave him the perfect example that's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. So James reminds the Jewish Christians that were scattered throughout the country because of persecutions that they do well to continue to love their neighbor, which in some cases were their enemies. Now in verses nine through 11, he says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law uh, as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And so what is James saying? He's saying that the law, the law of love, is not directly associated with the Old Testament ceremonial laws. There's a difference. There's the ceremonial laws, and then there are the moral laws. So the law of love is not directly associated with the Old Testament ceremonial laws, which was done away with the coming of the Savior. Rather, the law of love has to do with moral law not ceremonial, which continues into the New Testament. And in particular, for believers in Christ to show, uh, and for believers of Christ in Christ Jesus to show partiality towards a person because of their race, creed, color, or is a transgression of the law of love. In other words, friends, in other words, it is sin, which is another word for transgression, of the law, the moral law of God. And so Paul gives us a good example. He says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, he says, are all summed up in this saying, namely, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love for one's neighbor is demonstrated by not doing these things just mentioned against another person because you would not want those things done to you. And so love, brothers and sisters, is at the core of Jesus' teaching. Love is at the core of Jesus' teaching and his appearing. In other words, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 13, he says this. He says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now remember, Jesus is talking about actions. He is talking about doing. He's talking about love. So you must associate love 
that the love that Jesus is talking about as a verb, as something that's doing, he is laying down his life for his friend. That's the demonstration of love. That's what he's talking about. That's what Paul is saying. And so he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. And it was his love for us that led him to do this at the cross, at the cross. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. Romans chapter five, verse eight. Our, love, our Lord expresses just how important love has to be in the believer's life by telling his disciples this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 13, 34. Again, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then again, he says in John 15, 17, our Lord reminds his disciples again of the importance of love, saying what? These things I command you, that you love one another. And finally, friends, our Lord gives believers these words and says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Or if you love me, keep my commandment. The commandment to do what? To love. And I've already explained to you what that love is or what it does. God does not ask that we fall in love with him. God does not ask that we fall in love with him, and neither is this scriptural. This type of love speaks of feelings and emotions, you see, rather than actions which is the love that Jesus is talking about. But when our Lord says, if you love me, he is speaking of love as an action. It speaks of doing and keeping his words. That's why Jesus says, no greater love has a man, has anyone, than if a person lays down his life. That's the expression of love. That's a verb. That is action. That is doing. It has nothing to do with being in love. And finally, our final verse for this morning has to do, James says this in verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, he says, the law of liberty. And so James speaks of us being mindful of who we are in Christ. That's what he's saying. Being mindful of who we are in Christ Jesus. The law of faith that gives freedom, not the law of works, which came with the law of Moses. It is the law of faith that gives us freedom. The law of faith will judge the heart and motive of the individual. It is the law of truth spoken of by Jesus when he said, if you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, you are really, or you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, he says, and the truth will set you free. John chapter eight, verses 31 and 32. And so the law of liberty carries with it the concept of the royal law which James speaks of, namely that of loving your neighbor as yourself. It is by this law of liberty, he says, the believer is judged by. Therefore, if we hold to the words of the Savior, if we hold to the words of the Savior who commands us to love, then we demonstrate that we indeed love the Lord. And by contrast, if someone says that he loves the Lord and hates his neighbor or hates his brother or sister, he is said to be a liar, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 
So if a believer claims that he loves the law, but refuses to forgive, his love is not sincere, and he is in danger of himself not being forgiven by God the Father, according to Mark chapter 11, verse 26. And so Paul says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the law of faith, has made me free from the law of sin and death, which is the law of Moses. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. And so I close with these words, brothers and sisters. I close with these words. <clears throat> Excuse me. Obedience to the Lord. Obedience to the word of the Lord results in freedom for the believer. When you accepted Christ as Savior, Jesus broke the chains. You are no longer in bondage, spiritual bondage, a slave to sin, a slave to Satan. You have been made free in Christ Jesus, free to worship him as you please, free to have all the faith that you want in Christ Jesus. You are made free. And so I say to those who do not know Christ Jesus, that if you believe the word of God is true, and I believe and, and, and you want to accept Christ as your Savior, then I have on screen here the sinner's prayer, which says this: I believe the word of God is true. And I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And now I ask, O oh Lord, that you would come into my life. Forgive me for the sins I have committed. And be the Lord of my life. I ask this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. And if you're sincere, brothers and sisters, if you're sincere, then you have immediately received the promise of the Holy Spirit who will guarantee your entrance into the paradise of God and heirs of the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that your word is truth because, Lord, you have said it, that you are not a man that you should lie. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. And so we just thank you for your words, Lord, and we just ask and pray that the Holy Spirit now would inspire us, give us the inspiration to continue to study your word and that our faith may grow in Christ Jesus. I pray for those who do not know Christ as Savior, that they might receive him and believe and be healed and be made free. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful day, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. Amen.